why did no one understand the Met Gala theme? Although the rich and famous have been attending the Met Gala for decades at this point, there's no denying that the event has only recently become a worldwide phenomenon, largely thanks to the rise of social media, which has given anyone and everyone a chance to be a spectator and a critic in real time, including myself, of course. One of the biggest fashion events of the year, in the days leading up to and following the Met Gala, you can find an almost exhausting amount of coverage and content revolving around the event. And I'm afraid that this video is no exception. Today we're going to be taking a look at the Met Gala itself, the history behind this year's theme, and the ensembles worn by some of its attendees. Keep in mind that hundreds of people went to this event, so obviously I can't talk about everybody. So unless I'm referring to someone specifically, think of this as more of a general critique about the gala and that some of my statements may not hold true for everyone who attended. Also, it must be said, but this is about the clothes, not the people. Anyway, let's get into it. Traditionally held on the first Monday of May, aside from the 2021 event for obvious reasons, the Met Gala marks the opening of the Costume Institute's annual fashion exhibit at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Established in 1948, the event is one of the highlights of the New York City social scene and is commonly referred to as fashion's biggest night. The fundraising event was initially held at different venues around the city and was attended by members of New York High Society and the creme de la creme of the fashion industry. But in 1971, when ex-editor-in-chief for American Vogue, Diana Vreeland, became a consultant for the Costume Institute, she began inviting celebrities which raised the event's reputation outside of New York and set the foundation for the spectacle it is today. Besides moving the gala to the Met permanently, Vreeland also introduced themes in 1973, with said themes relating to that year's fashion exhibit. Although not mandatory, guests of the gala were expected to dress the part, something that has proven to be difficult even 50 years later. Current American Vogue editor-in-chief Anna Wintour has overseen the Met Gala since 1995, becoming the final say on everything from the guest list to their wardrobes, and it has since become one of the most exclusive events in the world. The 2022 Met Gala, in America, an anthology of fashion, is a continuation of the theme from the previous year, which was in America a lexicon of fashion. According to Vogue themselves, this year's dress code was Gilded Glamour, referring to the Gilded Age in the United States, a tumultuous period of time that took place between the end of the American Civil War and the turn of the 20th century. During this era, the United States became more prosperous and saw unprecedented developments in industry and technology, which resulted in rapid economic growth and an influx of European immigrants looking for a chance at a better life. Often glorified in modern media as a time of extraordinary wealth and opulence where anyone had the chance to change their fortune, the Gilded Age was extremely hard on the working class, who endured dangerous working conditions and extremely low pay while tycoons got richer and richer. With the wealthiest 1% of American families controlling more than half of the nation's property by 1890. Some of those families, like the Rockefellers and the Fords, are still hoarding wealth today. In the hopes of being accepted, the nouveau riche of late 1800s America attempted to emulate European royalty, and everything from architecture to art became more extravagant as a result. Many members of American high society began to regularly travel to and from Europe, bringing up-and-coming fashions from Paris and London back to the United States. And as such, America's golden age also coincided with continental Europe's La Belle Époque. During the late 19th century, clothing became more elaborate, largely thanks to recent technological advances that allowed fabric to be cheaper and easier to produce. And women's dresses came in a variety of colorful textiles and would be adorned with an assortment of trims like lace, embroidery, fringe, bows, and ruffles. Women's clothing during the Gilded Age is often associated with what we now refer to as the bustle, which created a voluminous silhouette that placed emphasis on women's backsides. Differing from earlier fashions of the Victorian era, which were more bell-shaped through the use of a hoop skirt or crinoline. During the Gilded Age, the bustle went in and out of fashion, and the first bustle period, or the early bustle, lasted between 1868 and 1876. This was interrupted by the natural form era, which removed crinolettes and bustles and replaced them with a smaller cushioned pad in order to emphasize the hips and help women appear naturally curvaceous. 
1883, the bustle made a return, resulting in the second bustle period, or the late bustle, which had the largest and fullest derriere of the bunch and lasted until the end of the decade, with the popularity of the S-shape eventually replacing the bustle period's hourglass figure in 1892. The emphasized silhouette created by the bustle could be seen as an ode to fashions of the Rococo period a hundred years earlier, which used panniers, or side hoops, to create its signature shape. As we've said before, fashion is cyclical, and the majority of the Gilded Age's design elements followed the more is more sentiment of French royalty from the late 18th century, a time period which had a similar disparity between the upper class and working class. And we all know how that turned out. Speaking of cyclical fashion, you may notice that some of the trends that were popular during the Gilded Age made a return during the 1950s, in a large part due to Dior's new look which focused on structured silhouettes that emphasized the female form. Menswear during the first half of the Gilded Age had a boxier silhouette, but similar to women's fashion, it grew narrower over the course of the century in order to emphasize a long, slender frame. With the increasing popularity of outdoor activities in England during the 1860s, casual lounge suits were created as an alternative to the more formal and restrictive frock coat, and men sought out a similar alternative for the formal evening tailcoat, resulting in the creation of a formal lounge jacket. As previously mentioned, wealthy people in the United States attempted to emulate the monarchy, and in 1886, men in New York began sporting the short lounge jacket that had become popular across the pond. There was initially resistance to the style amongst American high society, but by 1888 it had become accepted as an informal evening substitute. While women of the time were able to adorn their dresses with all sorts of decorations and trims, men expressed themselves in other ways, experimenting with their facial hair, neckwear, and hats. In stark contrast to their slim suits, their whiskers and hats grew larger and larger, leading to the Mr. Monopoly look you probably associate with men of the time period. Besides competing in business, the upper crust of America were also driven to lavish spending in the hopes of one-upping each other, and there was no better way to flaunt one's wealth than by hosting ostentatious social events. One notable example was a party thrown in 1883 by Alva Vanderbilt, which wound up costing more than $250,000, over $6 million today. An aspiring socialite, Alva felt snubbed by the old money families in Manhattan, specifically Caroline Astor, who at the time was the foremost authority on the aristocracy of New York and the de facto leader of high society. Desiring for the newly wealthy Vanderbilts to be accepted by New York's elite, Alva hosted an elaborate costume ball and invited a thousand people, purposely leaving out the Astors. As the biggest social event of the season, Caroline Astor had no choice but to finally call upon Alva Vanderbilt in order to secure her family an invitation to the ball, effectively giving the Vanderbilts her stamp of approval. This display of wealth, amongst others, fueled public interest in the lives of the rich and powerful, but this unimaginable opulence also highlighted the level of inequality that was present across America, and tensions began to rise amongst the lower class. During the Panic of 1893, the worst economic depression America had seen thus far, millions were left unemployed, homeless, and hungry, and frustrations towards corporate greed exploded, eventually leading to the Progressive Era in 1896, which brought about a period of widespread social activism and political reform that marked the eventual end of the Gilded Age. Now that we've explained the Gilded Age a bit, let's actually talk about the red carpet looks at the 2022 Met Gala. The previous year's theme, in America, a lexicon of fashion, was pretty vague, and comparatively, this year's dress code felt much more specific and direct. Yet, disappointingly enough, many people still wound up getting it wrong. I saw multiple posts on Twitter and TikTok that incorrectly attributed clothing from the Rococo period and the Regency period to the Gilded Age, which goes to show how little the average person actually knows about historical fashion. Which is by no means an insult, it's just something to keep in mind when celebrities miss the mark. Although admittedly, they have enough money and resources that they should be getting it right. The Gilded Age has inspired designers for decades now, with many releasing anachronistic collections that married popular elements of the Gilded Age with contemporary fashions. 
John Galliano regularly referenced the era during his time at Dior, with his Fall Winter 2005, Fall Winter 2007, Haute Couture Spring 2009, and Haute Couture Spring 2010 collections being some of my favorite examples. Other notable collections that took inspiration from the Gilded Age included Alexander McQueen's Spring Summer 2007 collection and Christian Lacroix's Spring Summer 1995 and Fall Winter 1998 collections. As you can tell from these examples, these aren't exact copies of outfits worn during the Gilded Age, which would have made them a great choice for the Met Gala as the event is first and foremost a white tie affair, not a costume party, something that is unfortunately lost on the majority of the guests and spectators. There were some celebrities like Casey Musgraves, Aquafina, and Autumn DeWilde who nailed the references to the Gilded Age, but the outfits themselves were… fine, to put it politely. But there were a few like Nicola Coughlin, Normani, Cardi B, Billie Eilish, and Adoa Aboa who not only nailed the time period, but looked damn good doing it too. Normani's kind of reminded me of a modern day Madame X, and Billie Eilish's look was reminiscent of the portrait of Madame Paul Poisson. Even Vanessa Hudgens managed to surprise me, with her sheer dress featuring multiple 1890s trends like the leg of mutton sleeve, a draped train, and a high neckline. Paloma Elsasser did a sexy 1990s meets 1880s thing that I loved, although it definitely wasn't as bold as some of the other looks, and Lizzo's outfit was as opulent as it was interesting. Emma Corrin probably had my favorite outfit of the night. Taking inspiration from New York socialite Evander Barry Wall, who in the 1880s was known for outdressing all of the other men in his circle, Emma had an oversized plaid coat that Wall was once seen in, but the rest of her clothes were tailored to resemble that of a young boy's, adding an air of whimsy to the outfit. I've gone back and forth on Blake Lively's gown. Taking inspiration from the color scheme of Lady Liberty, which was gifted to the United States by the French in 1886, the dress changes from copper to turquoise. Obviously, I appreciate the showmanship, but I personally wasn't a huge fan of the looks themselves. The original dress had a lot of Art Deco influences and felt more inspired by the 1950s than the 1870s, with the only thing keeping it on theme being the bustle. Once that was deconstructed, it didn't feel as unique to the period, and with the modern styling and strapless bodice, it felt like something she could have worn at any other event. Many of the celebs who appeared to nail the theme replicated Gilded Age silhouettes. And while I loved that, I wish more people had incorporated the loud fabrics and ornate trim that defined the era. Those details would have definitely helped some of the ensembles with modern influences look more on theme. Unlike past Met Galas where I've been able to pick out dozens of celebrity outfits that I've enjoyed that have followed the theme, this year my options were much more limited. The majority of guests seem to have misinterpreted the theme entirely, with many coming dressed in clothing that referenced completely different time periods. Chloe Grace Moretz wore an embroidered silver just decor coat, blatantly disregarding the fact that this piece of clothing was mainly worn by European aristocrats during the 17th and 18th centuries. Laura Harrier, while gorgeous, looked like she'd come off the set of the Tudors or Rain. Emma Stone wore a white feathered dress that she had also worn to her own wedding back in 2020, and it unfortunately left her looking like a budget flapper. Gemma Chan wore a robe de steel, a dress that took inspiration from the panniers of the 18th century, but with the dropped waist that was popular in the 1920s. Kris Jenner wore a near-exact replica of a Valentino dress worn by Jackie Kennedy, despite the fact that the ex-first lady wore it in 1967, almost 100 years after the Gilded Age had begun. Kim Kardashian wore Marilyn Monroe's iconic Happy Birthday Mr. President dress, which was designed by Bob Mackey back in 1962. Purchased by Ripley's Believe It or Not for $4.8 million, Kim only wore the dress on the red carpet before changing into a recreation of the sparkly gown for the rest of the evening. I wasn't a fan of this look, with the styling coming off as casual and cheap, and the naked illusion was a complete failure because it was a match to Marilyn's skin tone, not Kim's. Many other celebrities also wore sparkly, skin-tight dresses, with Olivia Rodrigo, Sierra, Addison Rae, and MJ Rodriguez looking like 1970s disco queens. There were also a few people who took notes from the Art Deco movement of the 1920s and 30s, including Sabrina Carpenter, Jodie Turner-Smith, Kaya Gerber, Amber Valletta, and Jessica Chastain. Many celebrities wound up wearing gold as a surface-level response to the gilded aka gold-covered, dress code, which I found completely uninspired. And I don't even know what to say about Kylie Jenner's outfit, except that I hate it. 
Perhaps even worse than the people who got the theme wrong are the people who didn't bother to try at all. So Courtney, when you heard that the theme was gilded glamour, like what did that mean to you? I honestly didn't really think about it. <laughs> Several celebrities like Amy Schumer, Austin Butler, Hailey Bieber, Hyun Jung, and Lily James showed up in uninspired pieces that they could have worn at any red carpet event. In fact, I'm pretty sure I've actually seen them wear similar outfits before. These people are constantly on red carpets in safe and trendy clothes. Why wouldn't you use this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to experiment? The lack of effort just winds up making them look lazy, or even worse, unappreciative. Even Anna Wintour, the host of the Met Gala, wore something that felt like a missed opportunity. When something inspired by Caroline Astor, a woman that she had a lot in common with, could have been iconic. As is often joked about when it comes to men at the Met Gala, their clothing is usually pretty lackluster, not just when compared to the women on the red carpet, but in the grand scheme of things. And somehow this year it got even worse. The Met Gala is a formal affair, which means that tuxedos or tailcoats, menswear that was actually around during the Gilded Age, would have been an acceptable choice. Instead, many of the men on the red carpet wore modern suits, and appallingly enough, there were even some streetwear-inspired looks. Sebastian Stan was perhaps the most egregious example of this, sporting a head-to-toe hot pink look from Valentino, which included a pair of sneakers, something that definitely isn't considered formal attire. Overall, I feel as though all of the men at the Met Gala could have done with more accessorizing. I was desperately missing the top hats, embroidered vests, bejeweled canes, engraved pocket watches, and ornate tie pins. And I can't believe I didn't see any mutton chops. That's not to say that there weren't some men who pulled out good looks, but they were definitely the minority. Ryan Reynolds and David Harbour went with traditional Gilded Age looks, which I won't be complaining about. Ben Platt and Evan Mock both did odes to men's corsetry, although with the rough light collar and slashed pants, Evans reminded me of the Elizabethan era more than it did the Gilded Age. Ashton Sanders had a brilliant take on the uniform worn by the Buffalo Soldiers, the African-American regiment that was created during the Civil War. Not only is it impeccably tailored, but the modern influences like the motorcycle gloves and updated silhouette take it out of costume territory and allow it to be its own thing. And I couldn't forget about Bad Bunny's Burberry look, which was specifically referencing the S-shape or pigeon breast silhouette that was popular with women during the late 1890s, combined with a man's frock coat. Considering how straightforward this year's Met Gala dress code was, referring to a period of time that literally lasted less than four decades, I still can't believe that so many people completely missed the mark, especially when you consider all of the resources they had at their disposal. Who had your favorite look at the 2022 Met Gala? and who had your least. I hope you enjoyed this video. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and I'll see you soon. Bye.